All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Can everyone hear me okay? Great, well, good morning or good evening to some of you who are joining us quite late. Uh, my name is Audrey Mossberger and I'm director of events at the National Bureau of Asian Research. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's expert discussion on the Korean Peninsula and the maritime domain, peace or conflict zone. Now, before turning it over to NBR's Vice President of Research, Ali Zalinski, I have just a few quick tips to offer uh, to optimize your experience. First, to change your screen view, you can navigate to the upper right-hand corner of your screen and toggle between the various options. We recommend a grid view or focus view for this discussion as each panelist will be pinned during their respective remarks. You've probably noticed, but your microphone is muted for this event. However, we do encourage you to get involved when we open it up to audience Q&A following remarks by our expert panel. Please type your questions into the WebEx chat box, which can be opened by clicking on the chat icon in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Simply select everyone from the drop-down box, type your question, and hit enter. Our moderator will do his best to present all questions to our panel within the allotted time. For those joining us uh, via live stream, welcome and we encourage you to email questions to events at nbr.org. We will also be posting one poll question towards the end of the event, so please keep an eye out for that on the right side of your screen. Uh, we would greatly appreciate your feedback. Well, we look forward to a very engaging discussion with our panel, and with that, I will turn it over to Ali. Thanks so much, Audrey, uh, and welcome everyone. Uh, good morning or good evening. We have some participants here joining us uh, from quite late in their evening in Korea. Um, and really appreciate everybody kind of starting or ending your day with us, uh, depending on your location. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome everybody to this event, uh, the Korean Peninsula and the Maritime Domain, Peace or Conflict Zone. This event is part of NBR's Maritime Awareness Project, which combines interactive mapping technology with rigorous analysis from the world's leading maritime experts to serve as the authoritative resource on maritime issues. The purpose of this project is to set maritime developments in a broader strategic perspective. So that's exactly what we'll be doing here today. As we examine recent developments in the maritime domain around the Korean Peninsula in the broadest, broader Northeast Asia diplomatic and security context. Over the past two years, with generous support from the Korea Foundation, the Maritime Awareness Project has undertaken a series of geospatial mapping, incident reporting, and analysis. And today, we're lucky to hear from three experts who've contributed some of those analyses to the project. Darcy Drott, who wrote for us last year about inter-Korean relations and maritime confidence building. Young Kil Park, who analyzed the role of fishing disputes in China's South Korea relations. Terence Rorig, who wrote about how friction between South Korea and Japan plays out in the maritime domain. This is a great time to be looking at these developments given ongoing policy shifts, a new administration in Washington that is uh, still working out its approach to uh, many challenges, including uh, North Korea. The Biden administration has pledged to revitalize US alliances and President Moon has responded enthusiastically to this early outreach. However, Biden's efforts to re-engage the two salient U.S. allies in Northeast Asia, South Korea and Japan, face many of the same enduring challenges that have bedeviled past several U.S. administrations, including differing approaches to North Korea's nuclear program, broad ROK Japanese leg of the U.S. ROK Japan trilateral framework, and continuing U.S. ROK and U.S. Japan burden sharing negotiations. All this is also taking place as U.S. allies in the region navigate the ongoing U.S.-China competition. Looking forward to hearing from our expert panelists about how the maritime domain will influence some of these broader security and diplomatic issues. So I'd like to once again thank the Korea Foundation for its generous support of the Maritime Awareness Project and this important research. And my many thanks to my colleagues at MBR who make this event possible. Audrey Mossberger, who you just heard from, Olivia Truesdale, Carlos Karnakis, and John Van Onaren. And speaking of John, who is our Assistant Director for Political and Security Affairs team, I'm now pleased to turn it over to him to moderate uh, the panel discussion. Over to you, John. Many thanks, Allie. Um, that's great. Um, 
I manage the uh, Maritime Awareness Project uh, here at the National Bureau of Asian Research, and we've got a great group of uh, speakers um, here today. Um, and I'll just run through them really quick. Uh, we have um, Darcy Draught, who's a PhD candidate at Johns Hopkins University, uh, I guess uh, soon to be uh, a, a PhD. Uh, so <laughs> Um, and then uh, she's also an advisor for Stratways Group, and she's going to talk us through how um, the maritime dynamics uh, impact uh, the inter-Korean relationship. Uh, and then we have um, Yong Kyo Park, uh, who's joining us uh, late at night his time, so we're very uh, appreciative. Uh, he's going to talk us through uh, maritime um, resource competition and management um, in the maritime domain. And then finally, uh, we have uh, Terence Rorig, who's going to look at uh, the ROK's uh, naval and maritime security uh, modernization and um, strategy. And he, he's going to talk us through that. So, uh, with that, uh, over to you, Darcy. Great. Um, first, I want to express my appreciation to Ali and John and NBR. For organizing this panel, and I'm absolutely delighted to be discussing these issues with Dr. Roaring and Dr. Park. Um, I'm sure we'll have a really great discussion. Um, so the scope of this panel is prompting us to consider whether Korea's maritime domain is a place or is a peace or a conflict zone. My remarks on inter-Korean relations starts with two related points. First, North Korea has exploited the ambiguities of its maritime border specifically with the South for its broader strategic goals. And second, its tactics dig into South Korean politics, as well as US policy toward North Korea, keeping some of the more promising cooperative projects from making any real progress. The first point I wanna make is that maritime issues and inter-Korean relations have really been dominated by North Korea's strategy to exploit the maritime boundaries, legal ambiguities, and the inherent dangers of the maritime domain. When we're talking about maritime issues between the Koreas, we're most often focusing on the West Sea, also known as the Yellow Sea, which has been the site of regular low-level skirmishes, near, predictor, near predictable artillery drills, and notable high-risk provocations, particularly since the final years of Kim Jong-il's rule through today. The ambiguities of the border is, like all politics baked into history. The maritime boundary between the two Koreas the Northern Limit Line was drawn as part of the Armistice Agreement in 1953. The agreement named five islands, as you'll see on this map, um, that would fall under South Korean control as the basis to continue the land-based military demarcation line from land to sea. At the time, the line was designed by, U by US forces, by UN command, to keep rock civilian ships actually away from North Korean soil. But nowadays, um, and since then, these islands have served as important bases for North Korean surveillance of North, uh, South Korean surveillance of North Korean military activity and aid in the defense of South Korean mainland. However, North Korea has maintained that the NLL was illegally drawn and claims that the sea border actually lies further south. It started, um, it ramped up a lot of these claims starting in 1999 when it unilaterally declared its own version which consents to ROK control of the five islands and, but, and concedes a generous <laughs> one mile water way around those, um, around those islands for rock movement. Um, I'm not sure if there's a, no, I don't think there's, okay. Um, so on the basis of this line that's much further south, North Korea takes advantage of multiple levels of legal and strategic ambiguity for its maritime provocation. So this happens on three, three levels. First and broadly, it uses its claims of the NLL's illegality to appeal to the international community to get buy-in for its position while also trying to undercut South Korean claims of the legitimacy of joint rock us activities there. Second, because of the competing claims and the proximity to North Korean soil, including its nearby military installations on land, North Korea frequently claims that any South Korean or joint uh, ROC US exercises there threaten its own security and its own territorial sovereignty, giving fur further rhetorical defense of its provocative actions. And there's a third important wild card in the mix. 
Chinese fishing boats frequently encroach on both Korea's waters for the lucrative blue crab fisheries. And Dr. Park will address the issues of Chinese fishing disputes, I'm sure, in further de detail. So I'm just going to briefly mention that this provides North Korean patrol vessels justification for chasing these illegal fishermen along and sometimes across the NLL. So using this framework, I want to turn attention to how Kim Jong-un has used these coastal tactics to heighten tension, designed to cause confusion and push space between the US and South Korea alliance by, and I'm gonna focus on events just over the past couple of years. Certainly we can look back to the events of 2010 as, as periods of extremely heightened, uh, extremely heightened tensions. You can see on this map, um, the Chunan sinking and then the Waipido shelling um, are kind of the apex of how South Korea or North Korea has used um, the NLL. Um, but even in the past couple of years, uh, Kim Jong-un has really played you know, a little bit of brinkmanship, a little bit of charm offensive, quite adroitly. So North Korea, of course, regularly uses coastal artillery drills, shooting toward or into the contested waters. And these are near regularly uh, regular occurrences. They most often co coincide or follow joint rock US drills. And these are drills that we know North Korea most vociferously objects as practices for invasion. They also use these um, coinciding with key domestic uh, and the diplomatic anniversaries designed to bring attention back on Pyongyang. So for example, in November 2019, North Korea conducted coastal artillery drills just north of the NLL on the ninth anniversary of the Waipido shelling, a clear signal of the chilled relations uh, with the South at the time. Thinking more recently, North Korea is able to manipulate these ambiguities to ratchet up its military in the current political climate as well. As one unfortunate example, an <clears throat> inter-Korean maritime ambiguities happened this past September when a South Korean fisheries official on patrol was shot after drifting into North Korean waters. His body reportedly burned in accordance with the North's strict COVID regulation. So this is what's showing North, uh, Kim Jong-un's um, toggling between these two different uh, outreach toward the South and um, holding a tight military fist. So Kim Jong-un first issued an apology for the unfortunate killing, which is a, a pretty rare concession to Seoul, but at the same time, perhaps in line with the current leader level relationship with Moon Jae-in. However, a day later, KCNA laid blame to the South taking it to task for not controlling its citizens in such a sensitive zone. Kim Jong-un, meanwhile, seems to be using the incident to justify further militarization of the border. It's reported that Kim Jong-un directed the general staff department to place units patrolling the MDL, the military demarcation line, on both east and west coasts, coasts on top combat posture, which incidentally, is similar to the order issued by Kim Yo-jong after the inter-Korean lia liaison office was blown up on June 16th last year. So to look at the other side um, of the panel's prompt, how the maritime domain can serve as a peace zone, let's consider some of the confidence building measures incorporated into the inter-Korean uh, relations of late. There have been some interesting and perhaps in another lifetime promising localized projects as part of uh, a charm offensive in the maritime domain. So the 2018 Pan, uh, Panmunjom Declaration included a significant provision for maritime tension reduction and initially made some progress on that front, including a short-lived ban on live fire drills and covering the barrels of coastal artil uh, artillery batteries. One interesting project that flew under the radar centered on the Han River estuary which was in uh, 2007, the similar target of No Mujian's maritime peace zone, but never got off the ground once he left office. Starting in November, 2018, a joint North-South survey team mapped the waterway along the Western inter-Korean border, uh, the Han River estuary, to jointly use the river for tourism and ecological protection. But since the South Korean Ministry of Fishery, Fisheries produced and then gave a map to the North in January 2019, the prospects of cooperative estuary management continuing is pretty slim because of broader politics. 
first, without the symmetry fanfare and no sanctions relief, Kim has been lambasting the United States as enemy number one and turning inward. And then since over the past year, North Korea has continued its coastal military exercises and artillery drills, blown up the liaison office and robust South Korean offers to assist with the COVID pandemic over and other humanitarian issues. So the problem is that South Korean leadership here is in a tight political bind with these issues, particularly as far as public opinion goes. In the South, there's a strong mandate to improve relations with the North. A week after it was, was signed, an astounding 88% of South Koreans thought the Panmunjom Declaration was good, according to a Gallup Korea poll. At that time, 58% thought that the North would keep the agreement, so it should be said. However, a year later, only 26% of Koreans polled they thought that North Korea would keep the agreement, showing that it's really susceptible to change. In this respect, the South Korean leadership's promises depend on the fickle North Korea. So Seoul has to maintain, at the same time, military re readiness in the volatile West Sea in accordance with the aims of alliance goals, the very activities that provoke North Korean hostilities. So relatedly, the last point that I want to make is that we can't separate these inter-Korean mar maritime issues in the West Sea from the U.S. role in the inter-Korean uh, inter issues, because North Korea centers U.S. in, in its provocations. And even inter-Korean confidence building measures can be derailed by soured U.S.-North Korean relations. First and foremost, as part of the armistice agreement, anything regarding the NLL issue needs U.S. consultation and sign-on. Second, the United States and South Korea must be prepared to jointly provide some assurances to North, particularly during conflict and crisis, that they are not bent on either preventative war or regime change. Moreover, the nature of the joint rock U.S. drills that take place in the West Sea means that tension reduction requires direct U.S. involvement as well. And while COVID has cast a shadow on inter-Korean cooperation over the past year, um, looking at historical patterns, we can say that stalled U.S.-Korea talks often take, uh, take the wind out of North Korean sails toward its southern brother. So even when Seoul is in the lead, and rightfully so, the United States does need to be on board. I put a lot on the table here, and you know, we can talk about inflection points going forward, um, but I'm, I'm hoping a lot of this is going to dovetail the points that Dr. Roaring and Dr. Park are going to bring up. So I'm looking forward to our, our discussion. Many thanks, uh, Darcy. Uh, and that is, gives us kind of a great overview of the unresolved uh, issue of the Northern Limit Line. Of course, we know, uh, you know, the, the maritime domain, another, another key issue in it is uh, resource uh, competition and resource management uh, when it comes to both uh, fisheries, but also um, hydrocarbons. Um, so we're going to turn to uh, Professor Dr. Yongkyo Park uh, right now, who's going to talk us through uh, some of those issues. Uh, Dr. Park. Yes. Uh, uh, this time, I, I would like to discuss about the uh, 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 maritime uh, uh, marine uh, uh, resource issues uh, surrounding the uh, Korean Peninsula. And the, I, I think the uh, uh, Korean workers, uh, Yellow Sea, East Sea, and East China Sea are all uh, connected to the uh, much more big issues in East Asia, uh, peace and uh, uh, maritime security, and not, uh, not only related to the uh, inter-Korean relations. So at uh, this time, uh, I will uh, look at some uh, maritime resource issues in Yellow Sea, uh, East China Sea, and East Sea. Uh, when, uh, when you look at uh, this map, uh, you can see it, uh, there are only uh, three maritime boundary lines in uh, first in uh, number one uh, is the uh, northern limit line. Uh, actually, it is not a uh, 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 maritime boundary line uh, by the uh, agreement. Uh, South Korean government claimed that uh, it is practically uh, 
you know, American boundary between North and South, but North Korea uh, does not agree uh, with this uh, South Korea's South Korean uh, claims. So, so uh, uh, there is dispute about uh, the the legal status of uh, MLS and the uh, um, um, the number two line means that uh, it is the uh, American boundary line of uh, continental shelf and also the fishery lines, and uh, according to. Um, 1999 uh, fishery agreement between South Korea and Japan. And uh, number three is the uh, maritime boundary line uh, between North Korea and uh, Russia. Uh, uh, the two states uh, uh, agreed the territorial ship boundary and the EZ and the continental shelf uh, boundaries uh, in late 1980s. But all the other areas are not uh, delimited uh, until now. So uh, the distance between the coastal state in uh, surrounding the Korean waters are less than 400 nautical miles. This means that uh, there are a huge overlapping uh, jurisdictional areas in, in these, uh, these waters. So only uh, between uh, Korea and China, there is ongoing negotiation for the American boundary delimitation, but uh, we don't know when it will be, uh, it'll be confirmed. So uh, now I'm going to focus on the Yellow Sea. Uh, first, it is uh, fishery issues. Yeah. In the Yellow Sea, there was abundant marine, uh, marine living resource, but it has been, have been decreasing and due to uh, mainly marine, uh, marine pollution and overfishing and IUU fishing. South Korea and China uh, um, agreed uh, the um, uh, fishery agreement in uh, 2000. And uh, um, that agreement, uh, we established a very huge uh, uh, provisional main zone in the Yellow Sea in, in the uh, PMZ, uh, provisional main zone, uh, both uh, uh, fishermen, uh, fishermen of uh, China and Korea, you can uh, freely uh, fish uh, in this zone. But uh, most, uh, 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 most of the Chinese fishing vessels occupied in, in this zone, uh, uh, provisional main zone. But uh, when we uh, look at the the trends of uh, Chinese fishing, uh, illegal fishing in South Korean waters, we can see that uh, there is, uh, it has been uh, decreasing in the number. Uh, uh, for example, in uh, 2015, uh, South Korean uh, Korea Coast Guard uh, arrested, arrested about uh, 378 Chinese fishing vessels for its uh, for the illegal fishing. But, but just last year, only 18 Chinese fishing vessels are arrested by uh, Korea. So uh, we can have the question, um, why does the number of arrested Chinese fishing vessels has been decreasing? Uh, I, th I think there are uh, several uh, possible answers. Uh, the first one is that uh, because of depletion of uh, uh, fishery resources in the Yellow Sea, because of, of fishing and uh, marine pollution. Another one is that, that uh, it is um, the effects of strong law enforcement by uh, South Korean government. And Korea Coast Guard, Korea Coast Guard claims uh, this reason. Uh, uh, another possible reason is that the cooperation of uh, Chinese government about the oil and gas development in the Yellow Sea. Um, um, and the Chinese government have explored many times in the Yellow Sea, and also South Korea also explored five times in Block One and in Block Two. But up to now, uh, we have failed to find some uh, meaningful resources here. But at uh, these times, uh, uh, there is tension in in the Yellow Sea. 
when China uh, tried to explore or conduct MSRE in, in these lines, is South Korean government uh, strongly protest about this. So it is, it caused a uh, sensitive tensions between um, the two governments. And, and now uh, let's look at the in, in East China Sea uh, fishery issues. East China Sea is much more complex than Yellow Sea because uh, there, uh, there are two uh, provisional measure zones. And uh, one is uh, uh, intermediate zone or uh, provisional measure zone um, established by the uh, Korea Japan fishery agreement. Another, uh, the other uh, provisional measure zone is established by the uh, China Japan fishery agreements in 1998. So it's much more complex than um, Yellow Sea issues. Uh, but I think the fishery issue is not much serious than, uh, the, than in the Yellow Sea. Uh, the, now, uh, the most, the most uh, significant or serious issue is about the uh, uh, maritime uh, jurisdiction issue. There is an EODO ocean risk station in just below the uh, provisional measure zone in the East China Sea. Uh, it is much more uh, located in the Korean side of the uh, median line, but China claims that the EODO, uh, EODO uh, risk station, uh, that area belongs to Chinese uh, EEZ. So it claimed that uh, Korea, South Korea breached uh, international law and uh, uh, Chinese EEZ rights. In East China Sea, the mo um, much more uh, significant, significant or serious issue is the, the fisheries between Korea and Japan since uh, 2016. The, there's a deadlock of annual talks by joint fishery committees uh, between uh, Korea and Japan. The joint fishery committee um, sets the, the uh, TAC total allowable, allowable catch every year. But since uh, 2016, uh, it, uh, uh, the committee failed to confirm it because but the Japanese, Japanese government wants to reduce uh, South Korean vessels from about 200 to uh, 70 in uh, fishing in its EEZ. So uh, it, 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 is, it is very difficult for South Korea to accept uh, Japanese claims. So at, uh, in these days, uh, South Korean fishermen Cannot enter to enter into the uh, Japanese EZ, so it is now the, the most big uh, problem in Korea. Yeah, uh, in East East China uh, East Sea, uh, there is there is a uh, intermediate zone or uh, prime uh, provisional base zone, but. I, I think there are two issues in East Sea or Sea of Japan uh, regarding to fisheries. The one is North Korean fishing in the uh, intermediate zone. Um, another one is the Chinese fishing in South Korean waters or North Korean waters. Chinese fishing vessels um, move to North Korea, uh, North Korean waters every year about in, on average about 2,000 Chinese fishing vessels uh, go to North Korea via South Korean workers. But when it goes to North Korea and get from North Korea, uh, Chinese fishing vessels uh, try to conduct, uh, try to some illegal fishing in South Korean waters and uh, another big uh, problem is that uh, Chinese fishing vessel acquired uh, acquired fishing permit from North Korea, but this will be uh, the viol uh, violation of UN Security Council sanction. And the last point 
uh, the, the last slide I want to uh, mention is about the Tewate fishing ground. Tewate uh, is located uh, just just outside the uh, intermediate zone uh, between South Korea and, uh, South Korea and Japan. <coughs> It, it is a very abundant fishing ground, but those uh, the dot, the blue, uh, blue color dot means that all uh, fishing vessels and uh, most of uh, the fishing vessels are located beyond the beyond the beyond the provisional median line between Russia and Japan. So most of the fishing vessels they are. Uh, they are North Korean fishing vessels. They are fishing in Russian waters. But these days, some uh, North Korean fishing vessels entered beyond the uh, that median line and, and entered into the Japanese waters. And, and North Korean fishing vessels claimed and North Korean claim that it it belongs it belongs our waters. So when Japanese government tried to control those vessels and North Korea claimed that it violated, it violated the international law and North Korean laws. So this is uh, some recent development and uh, some sensitive issue between North Korea and Japan. Great, thank you, thank you, Yonkyo. That's uh, and it shows us, you know, kind of how uh, multilateral uh, these issues are, you know, involving uh, so many parties. Uh, so I think that thank you so much. That was a great overview uh, of those issues, and we'll hope to um, revisit, uh, kind of get more in detail in the question and answer uh, session. All right, with that, I'm going to turn it over to our uh, final uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Terence uh, Rohrig uh, from the U.S. Uh, Naval War College, uh, who's going to talk us through um, the ROK's uh, uh, naval development and approach to maritime security. Uh, so, Terence, thanks. Thank you very much, John, and, and let me echo uh, the thanks previously offered here to NBR and everyone for the opportunity to be part of this event. Uh, great, great folks to work with always and, and great discussion. So my, my topic is going to look at the growth of the ROC Navy and to what degree that is prompted by what I think is a changing security environment in a number of respects over the last couple of decades for South Korea. First of all, the, the growth of the South Korean Navy is an amazing story in its own right. In the early 2000s, there was a decision made that South Korea would build its Navy from a small coastal patrol um, force to one that was an ocean-going Blue Navy force that would be able to take on a number of different missions and responsibilities. I think that decision was driven by a couple of very important issues. First of all, South Korea's econ economic um, interests, very dependent on exports for its growth, as well as the import of raw materials. And so the protection of trade lines, of, of access, maritime access issues, very, very important. And to have the capability, your own capability, to be able to protect that to some degree, I think was an important element of South Korea moving to grow its uh, ocean going naval capability. Um, as another element to that, uh, South Korea's economic growth that comes along with that story provided the resources to be able to build a Navy of this sort. It takes a lot of money to be able to build the types of ships and capability that South Korea has. And so its economic success has also allowed it to create the tools that were needed to do these and many other things as well. I think economic growth has had a huge impact on South Korean foreign policy and, and ability to be a player in the international community. But in this particular case, its naval development was a key part of, of that. Um, 
also, you know, I think that that the South Korean security concerns have long been focused on ground-based concerns, but again, that, that you are seeing a recognition that South Korean security is more than just North Korean uh, forces rolling across the DMZ. That there are, as, as Darcy pointed out very well, that there are a whole host of maritime issues that are part of this. As Dr. Pak laid out, the fisheries issues, that, that security is much more than just a land-based focus. And I think that they're, um, while they continue to certainly be concerned about the ground-based security issues, much more of a recognition that there's a maritime component to this, not only around the peninsula, but also broader in the region that South Korea can and needs to be a part of, but as well internationally. And I'll, I'll talk about that in just a minute as well. I think also there is an element here of the evolution of the US-South Korean alliance, that as time has gone on and South Korean capabilities um, have increased, more and more of South Korea's own security has been taken on by South Korea and less reliance on the alliance. And I think this is another case where it is about South Korea developing some more autonomous capabilities to be able to secure its interests in the maritime zones, but still certainly working closely with the US alliance and its partnership um, with the United States. As a result of that, over the last 20 years, the South Koreans have built a, a pretty incredible naval force that has included um, the, uh, the development of a, of a host of different types of coastal patrol vessels. It has also built several different lines of destroyers, including some of the modern Aegis destroyers, and they have plans. They have three already. They plan to build another three. One of the important missions that they have, in addition to others in the region, is ballistic missile defense, and so that's crucial. Uh, building their own line of submarines, um, an amphibious assault ship, and an, an amphibious assault ship, and as well just announced recently that they are building a light carrier. And I think what's really impressive about so much of this is that it is being built in South Korean shipyards, and so that is an indigenous. South Korean naval capability. Now the weapon systems often have to be purchased from the United States and elsewhere. But again, the fact that South Korea has built so many of these platforms in its own shipyards is another tribute uh, to the South Korean Navy and, and how it has grown from those roots within the country. Another element that is facing South Korea that I think is important here is how the maritime environment is getting more and more complex. Uh, you have, first of all, on the North Korean side, and I won't go through all the NLL issues that Darcy mentioned, but those are crucial. But as well, to sort of add on to that, um, North Korean submarines are a big concern. And, and she mentioned the Chonan sinking in 2010. The Yellow Sea is a very challenging anti-submarine warfare area because of the amount of traffic in that area, the relative shallowness of those waters. Uh, submariners tell me that this is a, a very difficult area to be able to, to do effective anti-submarine warfare. So that is a challenge that North Korea, excuse me, that South Korea needs to continue working on. But, you know, as we have seen over the last few months, North Korea continues to work on a potential nuclear armed submarine. That would add another piece to this, but I think we are a long way from North Korea having a functioning ballistic missile submarine. And then also sanctions enforcement, um, as it is, in my view, unlikely North Korea is going to give up its nuclear capability. Sanctions are likely to stay in place. And so the ability of, of naval forces to be able to at least monitor what kinds of, of sanctions enforcement is happening is another part of the North Korea piece and the complicated piece to this. I wanna just make one other mention here in, in this context that there has been on occasion some critics who have said, well, you know, South Korea's chief security problems are in coastal defense and worrying about North Korea 
And why spend all this money on blue water, ocean going naval capabilities? But I think when you look at South Korea's shipbuilding programs, they have done pretty well in my view of being able to address both sides of those issues. They have not neglected coastal defense and have built a number of new coastal patrols, smaller types of patrol vessels for that very mission, while also devoting resources to building the larger blue water naval capabilities as well. Then as, uh, as Dr. Park mentioned that, that there are Chinese issues that are of concern here, the, the illegal fishing while it has, has decreased still a concern, but the overlapping EEZ claims that have not been settled despite several rounds of talks and different viewpoints on that as South Korea argues that a median line principle should be the guiding um, way to divide the area, but China argues, no, it should be, China should have a greater share of that based on a proportionate sort of approach that looks at the population of China as well as the uh, length of its coastline. Um, as well, uh, when China expanded its um, ADIS area defense or air defense identification zone in 2013, much of the focus came to how this was going to impact the East China Sea and Japan, but it also overlapped what the South Korean zone had been. And in particular, um, as shown on the map here, um, Iado. And so concern, I think, in, in this broader maritime zone for what are Chinese intentions long-term, to what degree uh, does China intend on sort of pressuring South Korea to accede to its positions on some of these issues, that this is also another motive, I think, that having a naval capability that can push back a bit on some of this is also part of South Korea's um, motives for developing a naval capability. Um, to add to that, as we have seen this past summer and as well in, in 2019, Chinese and Russian joint exercises and air operations in these areas are concerning uh, and, and a naval capability can be a piece to that as well as we see that evolve perhaps in, in the years ahead. As I mentioned earlier as well, that, that there is concern for South Korea to be able to protect in its own accord, the, the, its trade relations, its, its trade routes and et cetera, et cetera, to be able to have its own capability to protect those, those trading routes and such. But also I think an interesting part to this is South Korea has recognized how this is a joint effort. And if they are going to expect an international effort to try to keep trade lines and trade routes open, that they also need to participate in some of that. And so since 2009, South Korea has been a participant of the international counter piracy operation off the, the Horn of Africa, uh, CTF-151, where they annually have a destroyer as part of that operation. South Korea has been in command of CTF-151 on a few occasions as that command rotates. And, and this is, a, I think, an important indication of, of South Korea recognizing its need to be and its participation in broader international efforts to secure the maritime domain. And we saw that played out this past uh, few months in Iran seizing a South Korean flagged oil tanker. And this destroyer was able to go to that area to you know, be to be present and have a presence there. Uh, ultimately, at least we, uh, South Korea, was committed to settling this diplomatically and has done so um, as it's gotten a pledge from Iran to have the crew released. Of course, there's another backstory in regards to um, uh, sanctions enforcement and such, which Iran, which we can get to in the Q and A, if that is of interest. Lastly, there is the issue of Japan, and in particular, the island dispute with Japan over Dr. Takashima. The South Korean Navy regularly does exercises to demonstrate its ability to defend these islands. If it comes to that, certainly 
it's not a surprise that a Navy is, is going to uh, do that. But I would certainly suggest that the chances of Japan mounting an amphibious operation to retake these islands is almost zero. And so, you know, this, this is, I mentioned this as another point of friction in the maritime domain between Japan and South Korea that um, is, is something to watch and, and, and hopefully does not boil over as it has not, at least on this particular issue uh, um, lately. Of course, uh, South Korea just recently released its, its 2020 defense white paper and has the obligatory statement in it about Ducto being inherent part of South Korean territory and the expected Japanese response uh, protesting that. And when Japan comes out with its documents, uh, we will have the roles reversed. Uh, but again, a reminder that this is a, an important point of friction between the two. Let me just stop by saying that, that South Korean power and influence has grown tremendously over the last number of decades. And with that comes a growth in South Korean interest beyond just peninsula security. And the economic development has allowed it to be able to build and develop the tools to be able to address those concerns. And the growth of the South Korean Navy, I think, is a, an important manifestation of those factors and, and a broadening of South Korea's views of what are part of its security. Great. Well, thanks for a great uh, set of presentations uh, there. I think it really shows us kind of how multifaceted um, these issues are. Um, <clears throat> my colleague Audrey just uh, put a note in the chat box. Uh, we're, we're very welcome. Uh, we very much welcome your, your Q&A and or your questions. Sorry. And we have uh, actually um, almost over 20 minutes, I think, for Q&A. So should be able to, to get to your questions. Um, and I think we'll just start um, by, by taking your questions because we've got such a great um, audience. Uh, so I'm gonna go uh, start with the, the first question. It kind of picks up on with what uh, Terry was just talking about, but it also um, dovetails, I think, with, with, with uh, Dr. Uh, Pop Yongkyo was uh, discussing earlier too, uh, because since uh, 1974, right, Japan and Korea have had this um, joint development uh, agreement, but it hasn't really, really gone very far. So with that, this is more about outlook. Um, is there a realistic timeline for Japan and ROK to arrive at a modus vivendi um, regarding their historic differences, you know, dating based in the historical issues in the 20th century? And that's uh, from uh, Professor uh, Bernard Cole at the U.S. Uh, National War College. So maybe, Yong Kiel, why don't you, uh, if you want to, I know that's a tough one to, to throw your way, but if you want to maybe just, what is the outlook in uh, the ROK uh, towards this relationship, and is this uh, uh, you know, modus vivendi, which I think, you know, is very much in, in the U.S. interest. Is, is, is that is that possible? And, and, and if so, what would a timeline look like? Uh, 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 the, the audience uh, mentioned that historic, uh, historic difference between South Korea and, and Japan. But I, I think that the uh, the, the history is the same, and uh, the difference is uh, the interpretation of our, uh, about uh, our, our past history. And uh, it, it is connected, uh, uh, very complex connected to facts, facts and emotions. So uh, I, I don't know about the realistic timeline, but I think uh, the South, uh, most of the South Korean ones, there, there's some sincere, uh, sincere uh, response or sincere apologize uh, from the Japanese government over the past. So I, I think it takes time uh, to recover just some uh, 
basic relations between 300 and some the normal relations, I think. Great, thank you. I know that's not an easy question uh, to start off with. And, and Terrence, you actually just wrote a, a piece uh, on this uh, for Maritime Awareness Project. Do you have anything to add uh, to that? Yes, uh, my my view has often been that that I think there are several different aspects of Japan South Korea relations that that are going to need to be dealt with sort of in separate tracks, if you will. I think the historic elements of that are the deeply rooted foundations of this that, you know, for the question in regards to a timeline, there's no timeline to this. And, and I dare say this is going to be a, a long, a long element to, to the relationship that, that may, may be difficult to address all these issues. But with that said, I think the, the, the best way to deal with this is to to be able to continue that that debate and, and the the management of issues in that particular lane, and then look at separately the economic issues and and look at how, for example, the 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 trade that was put in place by both South Korea and Japan um, over the some of the court ruling issues and such, you know that that's another domain that that those things could be dealt with in a separate track. And then, of course, there is all of the issues that revolve around security and that Japan, South Korea have a number of common important security concerns that also speak to the importance of cooperation. So the ability to be able to separate the history from areas like economics and security to be able to cooperate, I think, is essential. Or difficult. Great. All right. Well, yeah, that's not a, not an easy to start off with. But um, if you have some other other questions here coming in, and some some great questions. There's a couple on the theme um, looking at the the South Korea China relationship, and, and how do um, and this is from uh, uh, Rory uh, Daniels at the National Council on American Foreign Policy. How do South Korea-China relations play into the ROK's willingness uh, to use its Navy uh, to support uh, the U.S. ROK uh, Indo-Pacific, or sorry, the U.S., uh, not U.S. ROK, U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy? Uh, and then, of course, uh, I'll just add, you know, anyone that looks at the region will remember, of course, the, the THAAD uh, imbroglio uh, between uh, South Korea and, and China. Um, so, uh, once again, um, maybe Terrence, if you want to kind of start us off with that, and then we'll see if uh, Dr. Park has anything to add, and then I think we'll we'll pivot a little bit to talk about the the inner Korean uh, issues. Yes, and and a great question. I think South Korea is very reluctant to to participate in anti things that look anti china in regards to politically militarily etc and and the, the ballistic missile defense is is a great example of that um, the thad piece but also even more broadly that the united states and japan work together on ballistic missile defense and the united states would like to see a broader regional ballistic missile architecture built in the Asia Pacific region, but the South Koreans have been very reluctant to do that because of what, <laughs> excuse me, China's reaction would be. And they clearly got a taste of that in the THAAD issue. And so I, I think it's, it is South Korea's chief strategic dilemma of being caught between the United States and China and the degree to which it is willing to participate in joint naval exercises or, or joint naval activities directed against China, I think is limited. Thanks. Uh, Yongkiel, anything to, to add to that? Yes. Uh, yes. I, I, I think, uh, I think uh, Professor uh, Kering is, uh, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's right. And uh, the, the most, uh, the most difficult for South Korean government is is uh, 
yeah, our, our is very, yeah, it is, uh, there, there is no answer about the, our position between the China and, uh, and United States, right? Uh, as you know, the, uh, the US government, now the Biden administration wants the South Korean uh, much more work together with the uh, United States and Japan, but our in in terms of economy, our first partner is China. It's not not United States, but politically, you know, South Korea is much more close to the United States, and uh, so uh, we cannot ignore about this the economic issues, right? And uh, on a, I, I think another point we have to consider is about the it is North Korea. Uh, South Korean government, uh, we, if South Korea wants to unify with North Korea, but, but uh, without, uh, without the cooperation or help of uh, China, uh, we cannot unify, right? So uh, we always have to consider the position of China in, in this and, and Korean Peninsula issues. No, th thank you. I think that's a vital uh, reminder uh, for us. And I think that actually uh, transitions well to to kind of a question, some questions. I think about the the the, the inner Korean uh, relationship. Um, and Darcy, kind of, there's a couple questions, um, and maybe I'll try to kind of package them together, but. Um, looking at, you know, in 2018, you saw with, with the, the inter-Korean summits, the, this tremendous progress uh, on CBMs, I including uh, some in the, the, the maritime domain, at least tremendous rhetorical progress. And one of our panelists is asking about opportunities for CBMs in the Han estuary and NLL area. Um, I think that's an important question, but I guess more broadly, and this kind of ties into to what uh, uh, Donkyo was just talking about, where, how do you see this fitting in to the broader inter-Korean relationship, and where do you see that going uh, over the next, uh, you know, let's say the by, you know, over the next four to, to 10 years, particularly given uh, the provocations you, you, you kind of the escalation and provocations you talked about uh, in your in your presentation. Thanks, thanks, Darcy. Yeah. So, as you mentioned, the Panmunjom Declaration set up some space for some really interesting um, CBMs. The, the Han Review Han River Estuary mapping was one of them, and there was a team of ten North Korean and ten South Korean. Uh, surveyors that that map the region. The South Koreans produced the map. They gave it. Um, there was also a lot of interest from local South Korean um, officials and NGOs to cooperate at the local level, right? So, um, Kimpo City Mayor, for example, expressed interest in economic development, in in uh, environmental protection, um, and there is a lot of tension in South Korean society. Uh, public opinion largely, like how, what's the risks of, of overfishing, of um, environmental degradation versus uh, environmental protection, but um, there is these more local level, of course, these are um, often over, overcome by the, na the national level. Um, and so I think some of the more interesting um, ones would be these local level individual partnerships. Um, of course, we saw these, we see these uh, on the eastern, uh, the eastern border areas as well. Um, but more broadly, um, these are just as liable to get, you know, thrown under the rug with, with, with uh, you know, high politics. Um, you know, looking at the next year, looking at the next four years, um, these efforts really depend on one, what the Biden administration is going to say it, uh, its North Korea policy is, and it's most likely not going to do the the um, the favorable symmetry um, that allows for the space for uh, the Moon Jae-in administration to pursue some of these um, efforts. And then two, what's going to happen with South Korean uh, domestic politics in the next year, um, depending on whether there's a progressive or conservative administration really will shape whether these sorts of efforts can can 
can restart, w whether they could continue. In 2008, I had mentioned um, there was uh, interest, there was an agreement for a peace park in the Han, Han River estuary, but just a few months later after uh, Noh Moo Hyun uh, left office and Im Young Bak came into power, that was scrapped. And so the, the problem with these CBMs is that um, they're just so politically sensitive is that it really requires a lot of political capital. And so that's why rather than these being you know, a bottom up process, it really is something that needs to come in the middle, in the long term. Um, compared to other uh, areas where the, the CBMs could uh, could lead to longer uh, trust. Um, that being said, as I mentioned, they are integral to any peace building process in South between the Koreas because um, this area is so liable to um, to you know rapid uh, altercations at the local level. So yeah. I kind of want to ask you a follow on question about that. You, you mentioned it a bit in your presentation. Um, you, you talked about the, the killing of the fishery official uh, in September. And then there's all, were some other incidents uh, where I think like there was an RMK fishing boat that entered, or sorry, a DPRK fishing boat that entered an ROK port undetected. Mm -hmm. and a couple other things that and I wanted to ask you, and maybe uh, Dr. Pak will have uh, some input on this as well. How do those issues play out in the domestic politics of Korea, particularly the maritime uh, border issue? Uh, and, and is that something where Moon is kind of taking some some domestic political flack? Yeah, yeah, it definitely has. Um, both of these issues have been a bit controversial. Um, in the case of the fisheries official that was shot, um, there's a lot of speculation about whether he was trying to defect, and that has a lot of domestic political con connotations. The um, South Korean government concluded that he was trying to defect, but that's been contested by his um, by his family. In fact, now it's been referred to the Office of High Commissioner uh, of Human Rights at the UN um, because they have said that the investigation wasn't fair. Um, whether he was trying to defect really determines, um, you know, how the South Korean government um, has interacted with the North, Korea, North Koreans um, and how the South Korean public will judge the administration on this matter. Um, something similar happens with the, the fishing vessel that entered the port. Um, it came out that the fishing vessel that had four South Korean, uh, sorry, North Korean um, fishermen on it had been floating around in the port for two and a half days before being de detected. And so the South Korean public, it, it caused the South Korean public to have a lot of um, doubts on the, um, the South Korean uh, military to be able to, to, uh, to, to monitor and to provide the necessary security for, uh, for its maritime borders. In fact, it prompted the, um, the defense ministry to issue a formal apology to the, to the South Korean people. And so this is something that really is a sensitive issue um, to the South Korean government. The last thing that I will um, mention is that the NLL in particular is something that um, rings uh, to the heart of how the territory is seen to the South Korean people. So um, when uh, Noh Moo Hyun met with uh, Kim Jong-il um, to sign the agreement, um, over the, the, the joint uh, management of the of the um, of the West Sea issues, um, it later came out in 2013 uh, via an NIS uh, report um, that there was con um, concern over whether Noh Moo Hyun would cede to negotiations or would cede the NLL um, to the North Koreans, and so uh, it, it cast a doubt on on whether. Um, some territory would be ceded, um, and it became a, a real big domestic political issue. Obviously, by by the right in particular, seeking to to cast some uh, some doubt on the progressives. Um, looking at some public opinion polls, I dug up some public opinion polls from Gallup Korea, and half of South Koreans um, didn't think that he would give it up. Um, a quarter 
didn't know and a quarter thought that he he did say that. Of course, it, it gets a bit more um, pronounced by party lines. I think about 80 percent of conservatives thought that he he did say that he would um, put the NLL on the agenda. And so all of these issues are really um, a big part of how um, uh, how South Korea is seeing its territory, how South Koreans are seeing uh, the security of its territory as well. Fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I guess I think we should maybe wrap up because we, we haven't really gotten much into this, but it's it's the um, implications for, for the United States. And I think Ali uh, kind of alluded to this in her, her opening remarks, but, but, but thinking about the relationship between uh, President Biden and Pre President Moon, but also the, um, you know, where maybe they're kind of more natural bedfellows, uh, but uh, you know, I, I don't necessarily see um, Biden hopping on a plane to go meet with with Kim Jong Un. Um, how do we see that lining up, and where do we see these kind of issues of fitting into that the U.S. ROK relationship? So maybe if each one of you want to kind of give us a minute download on that, that would be that would be fantastic. Um, Yonghyo, why don't, why don't you, you, you start? Uh, because I know it's getting very late there. So, and, and, and thank you for, for joining us and, and giving us these, these insights. Uh, uh, I, I think the, the, the current uh, government uh, 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 does not want to provoke North Korea in in many aspects, uh, human rights and also the uh, North Korean fishermen. Uh, right? So when the North Korean uh, fishing boat or uh, fishing vessels are uh, intentionally or unintentionally uh, enters the uh, beyond the beyond the NLN. Uh, South Korean Navy or South Korea Coast Guard just try to block and expel it to North Korea. And when it when you found the North Korean fishing vessel in South Korean waters or coastlines, we just try to return them to North Korea, right? Because uh, South Korean government uh, does not want to use the, the North Korean issues in uh, domestic politics. Uh, so I, I, I think in, 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 many, in many ways, the, the South Korean government, the current government is the uh, Democratic Party's government uh, can um, easily cooperate with uh, the Biden administration. So the, the only uh, different point is I think the North Korean uh, a nuclear nuclear weapon issue. So, but except uh, that issue, I think uh, uh, South Korea and uh, United States can easily cooperate with. Great, thanks. Okay. Yeah, I know that was a that was a significant omission. I think from Biden's uh, speech uh, last week. So, all right, Terrence, if you want to talk us through uh, just very quickly the implications uh, for the U.S. Sure. Um, you know, I think, first of all, the important goal that the Biden administration is going to pursue is to improve alliance relations, as I think there's a lot of, of mending that needs to happen. I'm not pessimistic in, or I should say, I, I don't necessarily think that the, the alliance is, is in grave trouble, but I think there are a lot of issues that need to be fixed and a lot of, of attention that needs to be given to that. With that said, I think in some respects, you know, what you see the South Korean Navy, as well as its overall security establishment and development, uh, there's a degree of hedging going on there of not entirely sure of what the U.S. strategic direction is going to be in regards to capabilities vis-a-vis -vis China, but also in regards to commitment. And so I think that's part of the the repair work that needs to be done in the alliance. And, and so again, I think there is some concern at, that, that 
South Korea may need to be able to take care of more of its own security, um, even though the alliance remains central to South Korean security planning. There's a lot of work to be done in alliance management in the next few years. Great, thanks, Terrence. All right, Darcy, if you can um, just very briefly kind of explain how this you, you see this impacting uh, the U.S. approach to the inter-Korean relationship and, and vice versa. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think the one thing that's been made clear is that Biden has filled his house with uh, with people who are really um, committed to rebuilding this alliance, even though it's, it's it does have a lot of um, pretty tough. Uh, tough issues to work through. Um, and then the other thing is that they are um, they are likely to return to a, a more traditional North Korea policy than the Trump administration did, or a more predictable one, perhaps. Um, at the same time, Assistant Secretary Kurt Campbell said that the administration um, would want to make a decision not to rep uh, not to do repeat some of um, the what I think he characterizes it as delaying. Um, some of the, the the decisions toward Pyongyang that, that the Obama uh, administration did that prevented engagement. Um, and so I think there's a lot of timing questions here, particularly as Moon is counting down his term in office. Um, there's a window of a, a potential opportunity here as Moon is really interested in making some negotiations, um, some of the kind of inter-Korean exchanges, uh, including some of the, uh, the issues that we've put on uh, the table um, and so I could see some sorts of policies that would include the working level negotiations that a lot of us Peninsula watcher, watchers are so concerned about and less of the high level fanfare that a lot of us really um, don't see as more of a distraction than anything. And so as far as the maritime domain or um, issues are concerned, I think the biggest question is going to be is whether the, the ROC US is going to seek to placate North Korea. Um, with some of its scale, already scaled down joint exercises, which is really a continuing sticking point. Um, it, you know, press conference in January, President Moon raised the provoc a pretty controversial possibility that Seoul should negotiate with Pyongyang through its own channel about the future of these um, joint exercises. But, um, but that's kind of a, a big gap, I think, in the alliance that's gonna need to be addressed going forward, definitely, um, yeah. Great. Well, maybe it's appropriate to, to end. Not a good point to end on. <laughs> well, well, that's, uh, I think it's maybe a, you know, given the it may be appropriate to end with a question, I guess. So, and actually, we we will literally end with a question because we have a, a poll question here. So, uh, just kind of an open-ended question. Uh, feel free to uh, you know type out your your answer, just a word or two. I really want to thank uh, our three uh, panelists here uh, today, um, Darcy, Darcy uh, Yonkeel, and Terrence, for, for just a for really, uh, I think, great overview uh, of these issues. And, and I'll certainly be, be revisiting uh, this discussion as I, as I go about uh, our work. Uh, and you can also always check out uh, their, their work on maritimeawarenessproject.org or nbr.org. Uh, and we actually have a piece on the East China Sea uh, disputes uh, that came out yesterday on maritimeawarenessproject.org. So um, check that out. And thank you, uh, everyone, uh, for joining us today. And have a great uh, rest of your day or a great uh, evening, depending on where you are.